Today on Engine Power, the guys tackle Chrysler's most durable and versatile inline six with a twist, or should we say a slant? Legendary for being indestructible, today we're going to dissect, rebuild, and hop up a true American Colt engine, the bulletproof Chrysler Slant 6. Why, you may ask? Well, it's a popular engine several of you viewers have been asking us to go through. Its revolutionary inline six design is tilted 30 degrees off center to allow a lower hood profile, a lower center of gravity, and more access to engine accessories. From 1959 to 2000, Mopar produced over 12 million of these G-Series engines in 170, 198, and 225 cubic inch displacements, first for the compact Valiant, and then as the base engine in over 25 Dodge and Plymouth cars and trucks, from darts to diplomats and Belvedere's to Barracudas. And thanks to its extreme reliability, the Slant 6 also saw duty in scores of tractors, military trucks, forklifts, and industrial applications. We picked this one up at the local boneyard for 150 bucks, and while it's not gonna perform like a V8, this leaning tower of power is high in the cool department, but I think it has some issues. The distinctive unequal length intake runners were mediocre at distributing fuel, but still delivered over 30 miles per gallon and 145 horses at 4,000 RPM and a very torquey 215 foot-pounds at just 2,800. God, this thing weighs a ton. Cracks in Slant 6 exhaust manifolds were very common. This one fits right in. The valve cover has seen better days, but it's not going to the scrap pile yet. We'll use all the old tins as covers when we give it a paint job. Next to come off is the canned oil pan. Several versions were made depending on what vehicle they went into and the capacity ranged from five to six quarts. The pickup is screwed into the block and it can be removed as well. Up front, the balancer can be removed using our Matco puller. The stamp steel timing cover comes off next. Since this was a car engine and not a heavy duty version, it has a single row timing chain. We will be replacing everything on the side of the engine. The coil, the fuel pump, the distributor, and engine mount. Chrysler fitted this engine with an external gear rotor type oil pump. Its design and location made it easily serviceable even though not many problems arose. 225s were equipped with either a standard volume like this one or a high volume one in heavy duty models. The valve train features adjustable sheet metal rocker arms with a 1.5 ratio. They're held in place with a shaft which is how they're lubricated. The cylinder head is constructed of chrome alloy cast iron. Removing the head bolts in the reverse order of how they were torqued will keep the head from warping like a banana. Let's see what we've got. Countless years in the salvage yard let this slick sick soak in plenty of water. Unfortunately, it's taken its toll. Now we don't even know if this block will be serviceable due to the amount of corrosion. At this point, a lot of guys would go ahead and scrap this block, but we're not giving up. Plus, a little bit of destruction doesn't scare us as long as it moves us on to the next step. So the old air chisel's coming out of hiding. We need to see if the factory forged crankshaft will come out without removing the rods. So first, we'll remove all of the rod caps, followed by the massive mains. Now these share the same design and size from Chrysler's Hemi V8. You ready? Oh, oh yep. Oh. Nice. Oh, that's gonna make it way easier. On cylinders one and two, ah, got it. they came Ooh. out relatively easy because the valves were closed on those cylinders, keeping the water out. Ooh, nice. Hey, it cleaned the bore pretty good on the way out. <laughs> nice. Oh. As we progressed, so did the degree of difficulty but it came out with a little vibratory persuasion. Whew. Wow. Number four was the most stubborn. Well, the piston's moving, but it's not going down it, through it, the It's road. rocking. Our efforts uh, weren't working, so we're gonna have to get more aggressive with it, and before we completely blast the piston out with the chisel, we're gonna put a plate flat on the rod and hit straight down to see if we can jar it loose. Um, you moved it. Yeah, baby. I can't believe that. <laughs> That was awesome. The final two had the most corrosion and buildup on the cylinder wall. Whoa. We have no idea how many miles this thing. It could have a gajillion miles on it. 
So, uh, but that's I'm kind of sick and tired of vibrating. Let's get this last one out and then we'll talk about it. Man, I, 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 love, I love science. <laughs> I love discovery. They moved easier than three and four, but the rust cloud tells the whole story. Get out of there. Holy Ooh. moly. By knocking the pistons out of the top, it gave us a cleaner and better view to check the condition of these cylinders. As far as we can tell, they may be salvageable. The water pump is mounted with a lateral offset, which helped keep the engine as short as possible. Now they did have a known issue, the shaft would shear off of the pump. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> that is infant diarrhea. <laughs> the camshaft is standard fair six cylinder that rides on four cam bearing journals and has the distributor drive in the middle. Now it's being upgraded for a peppier grind from comp cams. The last thing we're gonna do is go ahead and wash this block before we send it off to the machine shop. That's gonna give those guys a head start with a clean piece. It's not rebuildable until the machine shop says it is. We're back. And a week has passed since we sent our Slant 6 out to the machine shop. But it didn't make it back. The machine shop found too many things wrong with it and it was just flat out unusable. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward with this one. Before we start assembling it, a few coats of Duplicolor ceramic engine enamel in Chrysler Red were in order. The original crank had a crack in the radius of the rod journal on cylinder number one, which is automatic grounds for replacement. Since our plan is to have a street friendly slant six with excellent drivability, a forged crank would be overkill for the application. So a cast crank like this one will be plenty strong enough for the RPM and power we're gonna make. Matching rods were also needed for that cast crank. That's due to the big end being narrower. Now on the forged crank, it was a lot wider, but they do share the same center to center lengths. The early model block had three freeze plugs on the side of it. This one is a later version and has five. Dimensionally, there are no differences. The ingredients for this build are all affordable bolt-on parts you can buy through Summit Racing. Names like Comp Cams, Edelbrock, Pioneer, Hooker, and Offenhauser will help us make more power. Even though it's fresh from the machine shop, it's always proper engine building practice to check your tolerances. Since it's not a high-tech racing engine, these measurements will be a little more forgiving. First, we're gonna check the main bearings. Our replacement crank cleaned up at 10 thousandths undersize on the mains. I'll use a two to three mic to lock in the exact size of the journal. Now the number one main can be filled with a bearing and torqued into place. I'll set the dial bore gauge up using the mic and check the torqued mains to measure the clearance. I'll repeat this for the other three mains as well. Don't ever assume things will always be right. OEM stuff also has a larger window of acceptable clearances for bearings, unlike a true race engine. All the rod journals get measured next, and the same procedure is used to check oil clearance for the rod bearings. I'll torque the rods in a special vise, and then use the dial bore gauge to check all their clearances. If you've never done this before, here's some interesting info you should know. The factory bearing clearances for a slant six on both the main and rod bearings ranges from two ten thousandths to 22 ten thousandths. That's a two thousandths range, which is huge by machining standards. Ours are coming in almost dead in the middle, which is right what we want. The rear main seal I'm putting in is something special available from Fast Fish Auto Parts. Hemi specialist Jeff Gunther created this seal to fix the age old problem of the leaky rear main seal on big block Mopars. Since this slanty shares the same main journal size as a Hemi, it's a fantastic upgrade. Follow the instructions to a T and you'll have no issues. Finally, it's time to lay the crank in. Royal Purple Max Tough Lube is put on the bearings. And 80 plus pounds worth of iron is set in its place. The seal gets a dab of RTV and is rotated so the parting line is inside the block. Going from the inside out, the main bolts are torqued to 70 foot-pounds. To finish up the crank install, we need to prep the rear main seal retainer. A little bit of Loctite on the bolts threads and some silicone on the side seals. It's ready to go in. After easing it into place, we can lock it down by torquing it to 30 foot-pounds. Last but certainly not least is the crank's end play. Now the factory range is from two to seven thousandths. This one checks in at a comfortable five thousandths. 
We're back at it and our leaning tower of power is ready for more parts. Now it's time to prep the piston and rod assemblies. First, make sure the dots on the rings are facing the top of the piston. Second, the ring gaps need to be clocked so they do not align. Now if those rings do align, you can get excessive blow-by which causes crankcase pressure and makes the engine smoke out of the breather. Now that's also going to make you second guess your assembly procedure. Here's some quick tech. The rings rotate on the piston as the engine runs at an average rate of 6 RPM. That's caused by the crosshatch angle in the cylinder. Now a piston ring is unique in that it is a reciprocating seal so it must move freely independent of the piston to operate properly. These are stock replacement cast pistons from Sealed Power that are for 40 thousandths overbore. Now the ring pack is also from Sealed Power and is a stock configuration. Almost all OEM pistons have a notch in the top which faces the front of the engine. The reason being the wrist pin boss is offset in the piston. Here's why they do this. Offsetting the wrist pin towards the major thrust side of the engine keeps the piston from making noise on cold startup. Factories have always done this so the consumer doesn't hear a slight clicking sound of the piston skirt in low ambient temps. The rods are riding on King non-coated bearings and will be torqued to 40 foot-pounds using extreme pressure lube. Now it's time for the solid flat tappet bump stick from Comp Cams. It's a single pattern with 220 degrees of duration at 50 thousandths lift and has 440 thousandths valve lift on the intake and exhaust. The lobe separation angle is 110 degrees. Ordered from Summit Racing, a stock replacement timing set will make the connection between the camshaft and the crank. Now the 7 16 bolt is torqued to 35 foot-pounds. It's an easy installation. Just line up the timing marks and move on. We'll apply Loctite high tack gasket sealant on the Felpro gasket to help prevent leaks and allow it to stick to the block and stay in place followed by the oil slinger which lubricates the chain. Now the cover can go on and is secured with ARP fasteners. To keep the crank snout and the inside of the balancer from galling when it is pressed on, a good practice is to apply Loctite anti-seas to the surfaces. It'll also make it easier to remove when the time comes. Now this balancer is from Pioneer and is an upgrade compared to the factory piece. Sealing up the bottom end is a Felpro multi-piece oil pan gasket. We'll spray the cork with more high-tack gasket sealant and drop them on the pan rail. Silicone needs to be applied where the gasket brake lines are to prevent leaks. Now the front end seal can be laid in position. It has locators that secure it to the timing cover. The rear end seal goes on the oil pan and is secured the same way and the pan drops on and is secured with more ARPs. With the engine upright, we can bring the number one piston to true TDC and install the timing pointer, which needs a little modification to align. So we'll cover up the original mark, and since this balancer will always be on this engine, using a rotary file, a new notch will be made on it. Now remark it with a white paint pen, and TDC is set. Now the pre-lube solid flat tappet lifters can be dropped into their bores. They were supplied with the cam kit from Comp Cams. A clean deck surface on the block and heads promotes a good valve seal between them and the head gasket. A Felpro Prino Seal composite is our choice for this slant six. Our valves are reground and will get installed with all new hardware. Now due to our aftermarket camshaft, matching valve springs are necessary in the head. These came with the cam kit and are designed to work with our increased lift and duration. We'll slick the valve stems up with Royal Purple Assembly Lube before sliding them into the guides. Now the new seal can go on and right behind it is the spring and retainer. Making this job easy is our Goodson pneumatic spring compressor. With the locks installed, this assembly is wrapped up. Oh, there you go. There's no need for high dollar fasteners to retain the cylinder head on this engine. Pre-lube stock ones will do the job just fine. I like the look of the black head on the red block too. Yeah, no, Looks nice. They get torqued in three steps from the center out to 70 foot-pounds. The push rods are a solid design that do not direct oil to the rocker arms. The upper valve train is oiled from this one rocker shaft stand that pressurizes the rocker shaft with oil and that splash lubricates the frictional surfaces. With the rocker shaft torqued, we can lash the valves. 
Now since the engine is cold, the rule of thumb is four thousandths tighter than a hot lash. Since this is an iron block and iron head combination, the final is eight thousandths on the intake, ten thousandths on the exhaust. Perfect. A Spectre stamp steel chrome valve cover is the crowning jewel to this leaning tower of not a lot of power. We're back and have just enough time to finish dressing this 225 Slant 6 up with all of its accessories. Letting the engine exhale is a super comp header with an inch and 5 inch primaries from Hooker. Now it's a two piece design with dual two and a half inch collectors. On the induction side, an Offenhauser single plane aluminum intake manifold that accepts a four barrel carburetor. They must be installed together. Can I hold it. So having two sets of hands is a big plus. I'm gonna push this header in as far as you can get it. Now a little modification was needed to the intake itself, so it tightened evenly with the header flange. Now the mounting pads have to be narrowed since they are thicker and share the same fastener. The header came with semi-circle retainers, and we're lucky they did because they're hard to find otherwise. Supplying the Go Juice is an Edelbrock 500 CFM four barrel with manual choke and mechanical secondaries. For cooling, a Cardone aluminum water pump. Now we can mount the heart of the engine. In this case, it's a Melling standard volume pump. A factory distributor like this uses a set of points, but we like a little more modern technology. So it's getting upgraded to this Igniter 2 electronic ignition from Petronix, but none of that's going to happen until you see this engine next time. That's because we found a home for it in a classic Chrysler that deserves a nostalgia engine just like this one. Now when the car gets here, we're going to throw it on the chassis dyno and see just how much power its bone stock 225 will put down at the rear tire. Then we'll work our magic and see what this slightly modified 225 will do. And we're expecting somewhere in the 25 to 30 percent increase range. Acura and Honda VTEC owners will be excited to know that they can upgrade their ride with this Trick Super Tune-Up Kit from Excel. The ignition specialist has put together these components that will not only make your engine perform better but look great while doing it. It comes with a high output coil, Thunder Sport spiral core wires, and a unique cap and rotor assembly that comes in several different translucent colors as well as this clear one. So if you want to stand out from the crowd in both looks and performance, you can pick up one of these kits at your local performance parts house for around a hundred bucks. Maco Tools has another hot new item making its rounds out on the trucks. It's a dual laser infrared thermometer that can read from 26 below all the way up to 1022 degrees Fahrenheit. The digital display is easy to read and it has a 12 to 1 distance to spot ratio. Now it comes in a molded plastic case to keep it safe with instructions and a set of batteries. Now you can pick yours up from your local distributor for right under 125 bucks. Edelbrock continues to lead the way in innovation for the good old small block Chevy with their new ECNC 185 cylinder head. It features a fully CNC'd 64cc combustion chamber filled with stainless 2020 and 1600 valves. The exhaust port is 75cc and the intake port comes in at 185cc. They come fully assembled with hydraulic roller valve springs and 3 8 rocker studs with guide plates. They fit 1986 and older intake manifolds and Edelbrock says they'll make as much as 30 horse more than a standard set of their Performer RPM heads. The price right at 980 bucks a piece. Well that's it for us, we'll see you next time.